Hey everybody, Brian Tulsa here. I was trawling for alt-right videos on YouTube and I wasn't very impressed with what I found. There are some excellent responses and refutations to most right-wing vloggers on YouTube. I encourage you to watch those videos. Support the good guys. Then I came across a video on a channel called Immortal Ideas entitled Why I'm Joining the Alt-Right, and I was intrigued. It was published in July of this year, so it's only a few months old. This guy is a recent alt-right recruit. I gave it a watch and I thought it was interesting. Despite the video not being very long, it meanders in a stream of consciousness way over a wide variety of topics. What I liked about this video is that the kid clearly hasn't read the alt-right playbook yet. There's a surprising lack of guile. One of the more frustrating things about arguing with the alt-right is their method of argument. They will switch between serious argumentation to satire to mockery to polemic. They're hard to pin down, and this is by design. Their arguments are meant to keep their opponents off balance. They sometimes try to disguise their racism with dog whistles and populist rhetoric because they think that's their ticket to the mainstream. Other times, they won't disguise their racism at all. If any critic makes any traction against them, they'll switch tactics immediately. They do this because the alt-right doesn't really believe half of what it says. They are all very aware they are racist, and when they claim not to be, they know they're full of shit. But it's all tactical, it's all marketing. They don't argue for the purpose of persuading, because their core principle is that one group of people is superior to another group of people. It is pointless to try to persuade the allegedly inferior group that they are inferior. The alt-right doesn't really care who is persuaded. It's all about who's in and who's out. It's about getting the in people to jump on the bandwagon as if supporting white nationalism is nothing more than choosing Pepsi over Coke. Seriously though, choose Pepsi. Pepsi is better. Theirs is an ideology to be enforced through power, not an idea to be spread through logical argument and persuasion. That's not to say I think it's pointless to engage the alt-righters. I think it's very important that they are engaged. I think they should be confronted every time they stick their heads out in public. But the purpose of confronting them is not to persuade them. They are not persuadable. The point is to make sure everyone else knows exactly what they're doing. It is to expose them and to demonstrate which side is reasonable and which side is full of shit. Then there's immortal ideas. He hasn't learned to play the game yet. He doesn't pretend the alt-right is about anything other than white nationalism or a white identity movement, as he put it. There's something refreshingly honest about that. The more and more I look at things, you know, the more and more I think the white, uh, you know, the white race at least, or whites need an identity movement. He is trying to think about these issues, but he's laboring under a number of falsehoods and false assumptions. He is regurgitating talking points without fully understanding what they mean. If this young, misguided man were to acknowledge some of the errors, he might actually change his path. I'm not saying he would transform into a decent human being, but I could see him evolving into something at least not horrible. So this baby alt-writer is worth addressing. Let's go through his video and see what he has to say. Americanism has always been sort of an identity with everybody living in the United States, but it wasn't inherently, at least for the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years, it hasn't been inher inherently about white identity. Linking American identity to whiteness is not new. It has been reflected in immigration policies throughout our history. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 limited immigration specifically from China. Japan and the U.S. negotiated a gentleman's agreement in 1907 to curb the immigration of Japanese people. The U.S. even reclassified some immigrants as non-white, 
so they could be retroactively stripped of their citizenship. The idea that the new white nationalist movement is a response to modern trends in immigration and the rise of minority groups is naive. It has been around for a long time. Through some of our history, we have kept it to the margins, but periodically it returns to the mainstream, as it has recently. He says two things about Black Lives Matter at different points in his video, but I'm going to play them together because I want to respond to them together. And obviously we have many groups like Black Lives Matter, you have La Raza, you have many other political organizations that are fighting for power right now, and obviously whites are going to be the, uh, you know, uh, just imagine if a group like Black Lives Matter was able to gain power. Do you think they're going to treat whites equally, or do you think they're going to be extremely oppressive? I mean, they already are now. So, you know, as uh, somebody from Black Lives Matter said, you know, Black Lives Matter is not an anti-white movement, it's a pro-black movement. Well, how about the alt-right is not an anti-black movement, it's a pro-white movement. You know, you got yours, we got ours. Black Lives Matter doesn't seek political power in the usual sense. It is an inclusive movement that primarily tries to prevent discrimination and violence against black people. Any power they seek is for that purpose. They are not trying to take over the country. Yes, sometimes it has been described as pro-black, but I don't think that's an accurate description based on the movement's own statement of purpose. Just read the page on their website entitled, What We Believe. If you're trying to cast the Black Lives Matter movement as some sort of anti-white racist group, you'll immediately latch onto references of race, as if acknowledging the existence of race and talking about it is itself somehow racist. Their use of terminology is also a little imprecise in some places, but read it more closely. Look at the whole picture. Look at the ideas. Look at the concepts. To love and desire freedom and justice for ourselves is a prerequisite to wanting the same for others. For others. They want their freedom and justice, but that's not all. Their freedom and justice is a step, a prerequisite as they put it, to the freedom and justice for others. That includes you, Mr. Immortal Ideas. Every day we recommit to healing ourselves and each other and to co-creating alongside comrades, allies, and family, a culture where each person feels seen, heard, and supported. Who exactly is frightened of that? This is what I mean by Black Lives Matter being inclusive. They are clearly concerned with issues involving the African American community in the United States, but they are clearly not a separatist group or anti-white revenge gang. I don't think calling them pro-black fully describes what they are. I would say they are anti-anti-black. But is it true that the alt-right is just the white version of Black Lives Matter? Let's look at someone who has said Black Lives Matter is a pro-black movement, which again, I don't think is quite accurate. Ed Jaguayo wrote an article in The Connection that addresses this very question. The difference between Black Lives Matter and the KKK, the alt-right, or any other group claiming to be the white equivalent is in goals. The goal of Black Lives Matter is equality. The goal of the white counterparts is segregation and white superiority. You can't have two groups with opposite and conflicting goals and call them equivalent. Black Lives Matter does not want to do for blacks what the alt-right and the KKK wants to do for whites. To many extent on many, many college campuses, you can see whites are treated like shit. They're treated as the untouchables on many of these college campuses. They're, you know, excluded from going into certain, uh, you know, group meetups and things like that. They're always denigrated in classroom. The teachers, the students, they always sit there and they always clap and get their good boy points when they sit there and talk shit about white people or talk shit about, uh, you know, white history or the United States history as a whole, talking about, oh, white supremacist country and everything like that. I know personal experience is anecdotal, not data, but here I'll offer my personal experience for any value it might add to the discussion. Despite my age, I have spent a lot of time in recent years on college campuses and in college classrooms. I was a non-traditional student. My experience with college classrooms is fairly recent. I can't say what Immortal Ideas claims is never true anywhere, but it was not true in any class I attended, nor on any campus. What I suspect happens more often is, 
white racism is denigrated and disrespected on college campuses. But that's not the same thing as whites being denigrated, nor is it the same thing as white culture being denigrated. What likely is denigrated is a wrong-headed and toxic version of white culture. But that would still bother someone like Immortal Ideas, because he's not really wanting fairness for white students. He's wanting classrooms to become indoctrination centers for white racism. In fact, there have been a few times when black professors have been fired for saying racist things about whites. And the alt-right has unleashed outrage when they thought a black professor said some negative thing about whites, but when you dig into those claims, they are often taken out of context. It's really not very easy to find examples of white students being oppressed and discriminated against on college campuses. You can hunt down a handful of examples, but not enough to call it a trend. Really, if it's so hard to find facts to prove your point, and if some of the examples have to be taken out of context to prove your point, maybe you don't really have a point. Obviously, the history is under attack. We've seen this in many aspects with just trying to remove Confederate monuments, like Robert E. Lee's statue, for example, in New Orleans. Whoa, quick topic change. We went from talking about college campuses to removing Confederate monuments. You know, Robert E. Lee was a man of great... Uh, you know, resilience. He wasn't a slave owner. He actually didn't even like the practice of slavery. The reason that he fought in the Southern Army was because Virginia happened to go into the South. All right, here is where the bullshit meter goes off the scale. Here we have something that is not merely a difference of opinion, but a misstatement of fact. I do appreciate that he doesn't pretend the Civil War was about anything but slavery. He doesn't feed us that states' rights line of bullshit. Like I said, this guy does seem sincere, a little naive, and kind of adorable, but still wrong. Still very, very wrong. Let's dispel some myths about Robert E. Lee. First, Robert E. Lee was a slave owner. He owned slaves. This is a historical fact. Not only was he a slave owner, he was an especially cruel slave owner. He tortured slaves that had escaped and were recaptured. He broke up the families of slaves and sold off family members. Not only was he for the institution of slavery, he was a practitioner. He made some statements which, if taken out of context, would make you think he cared about black people. But in context, all of those statements were patronizing. Lee thought slavery was good for black people. Lee supported the institution of slavery in both word and deed, before, during, and after after the war. He fought to defend it, he practiced it. During the war, he enslaved previously free black people in the North. This myth about Lee doesn't come from history. It comes from the Lost Cause movement, which was basically a propaganda campaign that tried to sanitize parts of history that reflected poorly on the South. The fact that you got an important fact wrong, you said Lee didn't own slaves, means you're not actually reading the history books. You're getting your information from people who are lying to you. You know, removing his statue, it's like, what's the point of it? What, what is that doing? You're just going to relegate it to the back of a history museum so that, you know, people can just eventually forget about it? This line of thinking always amuses me. People aren't removing the statues because they are ignorant of history or because they want anyone to forget about it. The statues are being removed because people do know the history and they are acknowledging it. Nobody wants it forgotten because they don't want it repeated. But choosing not to honor monsters is not the same thing as forgetting. It's the opposite, really. He was a huge part, a huge player in the United States, especially in the late 1800s. You know, he was a man of great conviction, he was a man of great action. Lee was as much of a bastard after the war as he was before it. He was opposed to freeing blacks in the South after the war. He was opposed to letting black people vote. When he was the president of Washington College, he allowed the students to form a chapter of the KKK. Oh, okay, maybe he might have, uh, you know, he wasn't as progressive on, you know, blacks and whites as, uh, you know, people are nowadays, but that doesn't define who he is. Just because his I, views on race relations weren't as progressive as you would hope for, it doesn't mean that he's an awful person, doesn't mean that his statue should be removed, you know? He wasn't just non-progressive. He was a white supremacist to the bone, even by the standards of the time. But I'm confused. Are you suggesting that being unprogressive on race is a bad thing? 
Are you saying he should have been more progressive, but we should overlook that because he had good attributes? If you're taking a stand in favor of progressive views on race, please go preach that to your alt-right buddies. See how long that lasts. But don't just remove the other ones because you don't like it. It's something that everybody who is an American should learn about. I agree with one thing. Everyone in America should learn about it. But that's not what statues are for. The educational value of a statue is minimal. Shit, if you get your education from statues, you might believe some nonsense, like Robert E. Lee didn't own slaves. Their purpose is to honor heroes. That becomes very complicated when the person it honors was actually a monster. Should Lee still be honored, immortal ideas? You thought so, but you also believed some incorrect things about Lee. I guarantee you didn't know any of these facts before now, but now you know. If you thought Lee was virtuous because he didn't own slaves and he was a decent guy after the war, do you now think he is less virtuous because he did own slaves, and he tortured those slaves, and he ripped their families apart, and he encouraged hate and discrimination against the freedmen until his dying day? Is he still virtuous in your eyes? If so, you'll have to re-examine what you consider virtuous. Or, you'll have to admit that you admire Lee because he was a slave-owning, slave-torturing, white supremacist piece of garbage. You'll have to drop the pretense. You can respect certain people who fought in the Confederate Army. They weren't all evil people. Only 10% of people in the Confederate Army owned slaves. This is just wrong. Like the Robert E. Lee errors, this is factually false. Although the majority of Southerners didn't own slaves, it was much more common than 10%. Across the South, an average of 32% of white families own slaves. That may be a minority, but it is a significant minority. It's a large enough number that everyone either owned slaves or knew someone who did. And those who didn't own slaves wanted to. It was a sign of social status. Was every Confederate soldier a monster? No. Some were just fools. But all of them fought to uphold a race-based caste system in which the lowliest white person was still above a black slave, and where white people could own other human beings as property. That's what they fought for, and that's why we don't honor them. Hundreds of thousands of white men died so that slaves could be freed, so it shouldn't be something that's just forgotten and relegated to the backs of our minds and to the backs of museums. Yes, hundreds of thousands of Union soldiers died so slaves could be free. Those were the real American veterans. Confederate soldiers died for the opposite, to prevent those slaves from being free. Many of the Union soldiers saw those Confederate soldiers as exactly what they were, enemies of the United States. A lot of Union soldiers bristled at the sight of Confederate monuments being erected in their lifetime. Lee was no hero to them. We don't typically erect statues to enemies of the United States' immortal ideas. Why would we do that? It would be absurd. You know, thousands of Americans died fighting Al-Qaeda after terrorist attacks in the United States. If Confederates are to be honored because thousands of white men died so slaves could be free, then should we have Al-Qaeda monuments because thousands of Americans fought against terrorism? Do you think we're supposed to erect statues to the enemy? Where's your Al-Qaeda statue, Immortal Ideas? When are you going to advocate for that one? Lord knows we wouldn't want future generations to forget about Al-Qaeda. Get right on that. Oh, wait a minute. One more question. Was fighting to free slaves a good thing? Because Robert E. Lee didn't think so. Try walking down the street with a Make America Great Again hat and see if you, uh, you know, can actually get to the other side alive. Uh, there are many, uh, there are obviously white people who have been tortured by, you know, non-whites and things like that. There are white people who are just bullied day to day, day in, day out. White men especially. Uh, it happens all the time, but it's not just white men, it's white women as well. They get attacked by groups like Antifa, funny enough, even though they are white. I am not a member of the Antifa movement. I find some of their ideas and tactics silly and counterproductive. They oppose fascists, though, so at least they have that going for them. But let's talk about this idea that whites are being attacked by Antifa. Yes, Antifa has a faction that promotes violence against fascists. Yes, some members of Antifa are comfortable using violence against political opponents. But here's the reality about Antifa violence. They're all talk. 
All talk and no bite. The actual violence that comes out of the Antifa movement is nowhere near the violence that comes out of the alt-right and related white nationalist groups. Of all the deaths caused by extremists in the United States, left-wing extremists accounted for only 2%, compared with 74% caused by right-wing extremists. Even 2% is 2% too many, of course. But any fear of being attacked by Antifa is irrational. It's extremely unlikely someone is going to injure you for wearing a Make America Great Again hat. There are some people who would like to injure you, but they're all bark and no bite. On the occasions where Antifa has acted violently, it's usually in reaction to provocation by right-wing protesters. The alt-right guys edit video of it to make it look like the Antifa started it, and it's played up as if it happens all the time. It doesn't happen all the time. Don't be scared. You're not in danger. Relax. There are many poor white communities around the United States. There are many poor white kids that could benefit from something like, a, like an affirmative action program that aren't able to get into schools because non-whites who come from a much better socioeconomic stance than they do get the, uh, you know, they get into the universities because the poor white kid just happens to be white, even though he grew up and he had none of the advantages that many of these non-whites actually have. American whites still attend college at higher rates than minorities. In 2013, enrollment rates for whites was 42%. For black and Hispanics, it was about 34% each. College campuses in the U.S. are still pretty Caucasian. I'm getting the idea that this immortal ideas guy hasn't spent much time on a college campus, yet speaks as though he's an authority on it. Also, in the case Regents of the University of California v. Bakke, the Supreme Court ruled that racial quotas in college admissions was unconstitutional. Colleges could use other means to diversify their student body, but not quotas. This means colleges can't just decide that a black student can take the spot that would otherwise go to a qualified white student. But a lot of institutional barriers to minority students have been lifted, and of course if you lift those barriers, you will have more minority students. That doesn't mean unqualified minority students are taking the places of qualified white students. Previously, a more qualified minority student would lose the space to a less qualified white student. That was a sort of affirmative action for white students. If those less qualified white students don't get into college now, well, it's because they're less qualified. I mean, take Harvard Medical School, for example. Two black students were admitted in 1850, but the white students and faculty objected, so they were kicked out. What a bunch of assholes. Those two qualified black students were removed and replaced either by less qualified white students or nobody at all. You oppose that, right, Immortal Ideas? You're against that, aren't you? Because you're so progressive on race issues, I mean. Something can be done for poor whites who don't have the best opportunities to be able to further their own education. On this, I halfway agree with immortal ideas. I would just change one word. Instead of something could be done for poor whites, I would say something could be done for poor people. There are poor white communities, and something could be done about poverty. Poverty still disproportionately impacts the non-whites. The community with the highest poverty rate is Native Americans. African Americans have the second highest poverty rate. In 2007 to 2011, the poverty rate for whites in the U.S. was 11.6%, which was lower than the national average of 14%. But it is true that poverty touches every race. It is also true that poverty in white communities enables hateful ideologies to spread. I am all for addressing poverty in white communities as well as minority communities. I'm not mocking immortal ideas here at all. Sometimes the white nationalists that complain about poverty actually are poor. They feel as powerless as any other poor person. The solution to their poverty isn't racism and scapegoating minorities. If they decided to work with rather than against minorities, we might actually do something about poverty in this country. Another thing I'm obviously against is massive immigration. Uh, you know, replacing somebody, people around the world are not the same. You can't just take, you know, Italians, move them somewhere else, bring in North Africans and sit there and say that that's, that's Italy. You know, they're Italian now, you know, uh, great. No, that just doesn't happen. You can't replace a people and sit there and think that 
it's something that's going to benefit your country. Obviously, I've talked about the Kalergi plan before. The Kalergi plan is referring to Richard von Kodenholf Kalergi, one of the architects of the European Union. What Immortal Ideas is talking about, without naming it, is the so-called Great Replacement. It's a coin turned by a French writer named Renaud Camus. Camus describes it thus, The Great Replacement is very simple. You have one people, and in the space of a generation, you have a different people. Immortal Ideas even frames it in these terms. You can't replace Italians with non-Italians. White nationalists tout certain statistics to back up this idea. For instance, the percentage of immigrants in Sweden was 14.5% in the year 2000 and 23.2% .2 in 2017. Oh no, where are all the native Swedes going? They'll be majority Muslim before you know it. But here's the thing about the Great Replacement. It isn't happening. Not at all. Absolutely nobody is being replaced. What's happening with the percentage of immigrants in Europe is an addition, not a replacement. This may seem like semantics, but that specific terminology is very important to white nationalists. When they chant, you will not replace us, that's what they're talking about. <laughs> And it's all phony. All of it. It's such a stupid, kindergarten-level misuse of statistics that it would be laughable if it wasn't being used to encourage hate and violence. But then, remember, the alt-right doesn't care whether it's true or not, because they're not about crafting a logical argument based on facts. It's about marketing. You will not replace us is a slogan. It doesn't matter if there's any truth behind the slogan. Regardless of the video, the uh, threat is very real. Uh, unlike Poland, for example, you can see how, uh, how, much, how much disdain the EU has, how they're almost going to start placing sanctions on Poland because they're not taking in refugees. They're not buying the bullshit of the EU. They're not buying the bullshit. They're not buying the bullshit. This is the one place where Immortal Ideas actually raises his voice and sounds a little angry. I've watched it a few times and it makes me giggle a little bit. Uh, he doesn't have the fire in the belly that the more vocal alt-right has. Even this little flash of anger sounds forced and contrived. He is trying so hard. And the... Polish people actually want to stay homogeneously Polish. They want to continue to keep their culture. You know, they don't want to just disappear and just break off into the dust and, you know, blow away with the wind. Admire Poland for its racial purity? Want to know how Poland got so racially pure? Before 1939, about 10% of Poland's population was Jewish. Not anymore, though. Want to know why not? World War II. Ethnic cleansing. The Holocaust. I don't know if Immortal Ideas is a Holocaust denier or not, but just accept for the sake of argument that it happened. Does someone like Immortal Ideas consider that a good thing or a bad thing? Is Poland's racial purity worth the death of about 3 million Polish Jews? Is that admirable? Don't duck the question, answer it, and stop pretending you aren't a monster that admires other monsters. They're not buying the bullshit. <laughs> uh, that will never get old. It is true that there have been Islamist terrorist attacks in Europe, and the perpetrators should always be held accountable. But is immigration and taking in refugees really a problem in Europe? Immortal Ideas cites Poland as an example of a great country holding on to its racial purity. If Poland is refusing to take in refugees and is one of the most homogenous states in Europe, it's not a good example of what happens when immigrants and refugees are allowed in. So let's look at a better example. Let's look at Sweden. Immigration to Sweden has slowed a bit in the last two years, but Sweden has been far more open to immigrants and refugees than Poland. How has that fared for Sweden? The overall crime statistics have gone down. There is no link between crime and immigration. In some areas where immigrants are overrepresented in crime statistics, it is found to be due to unemployment, poverty, exclusion, and low language skills. Native Swedes with those characteristics are also overrepresented in crime statistics. 
It turns out immigrants are just normal people and act as normal people do to negative social pressures. Crime reporting in Sweden went up slightly in 2015, oddly the same year the Swedish government slowed the flow of asylum seekers to the country. And the rate was down in 2014. And even the very slightly higher rate in 2015 was basically the same as it was in 2005. The crime rate is virtually flat for a decade. Of course, correlation doesn't imply causation, so we can't say that restricting immigration caused crime reporting to increase, but neither can we say there is a correlation between immigration and crime. The expected immigration crime wave just didn't happen. This immigration wave, you know, it's not against necessarily the people, but these people aren't assimilating back when, you know, you had many Irish immigrants come into the countries. They were obviously, they were more inclined to assimilate because they were not really a whole lot different than much of the populace. Have you no idea how much Irish immigrants were hated in the U.S.? Hatred for Irish immigrants led to the formation of a new political party, the Know-Nothings. I rather wish the alt-right would adopt that name, since it is apt, the Know-Nothings. As for whether the Irish assimilated, that depends on what you mean by assimilate. Did they change their religion? No. If they were Catholic before they came, they remained Catholic after they got here. They brought their Catholicism with them. And by the way, Catholics were very distrusted in the early decades of the Union. Some people considered Catholics to have their primary allegiance to the Pope, so they couldn't be true loyal Americans. That should sound familiar to you because that's basically how you treat Muslims now. The Irish didn't have so much of a language barrier, so we can't use that as a measure of assimilation. They kept a lot of their traditions, their food, their culture. Of course, those things were altered a bit by interacting with American traditions. Like all immigrants, they changed American culture a little, and American culture changed them a little. But what about immigrants that don't speak English? Let's look at a better example. Let's look at Latinos in the United States. According to that left-wing propaganda machine, Pew, first-generation Spanish-speaking immigrants are less likely to be bilingual, as expected. However, by the third generation, 78% are predominantly English speakers, and another 22% are bilingual. In other words, all of them speak English and most of them speak primarily English. So they are assimilating, if you use language as a proxy for assimilation. So, does that mean immigration is not a problem? You said the main issue was that they weren't assimilating, but you were wrong about that, like you're wrong about nearly everything else. So you're fine with immigration now, right? We're, gonna, we're not going to make them assimilate. We're not going to make them learn English. We're not going to make them, you know, care about the culture, care about the demographics at all. Well, no, because we don't have to make them assimilate. We don't have to force them to learn English. A few seconds earlier, you said you were for individualism and against tyranny. But isn't it rather tyrannical to force people to accept cultural norms and language? Where's their individual choice? Or do you mean only individualism for white people? What happens when a non-white person decides to be an individual and doesn't do what you think he should do? Then I guess you're all for big government and tyranny. Make them. Force them. Obviously, they're not assimilating, and a lot of that has to do with many of the cultural Marxists and institutions who are just constantly and dogmatically changing the, the younger people in our country, unfortunately, they have the right to vote, which is sad, but, you know, eventually they're going to, you know, advocate for policies that are just going to fundamentally and completely change the United States in, into something that's just unrecognizable. When Immortal Ideas refers to cultural Marxism, he's not referring to a legitimate theory in social science. He's referring to a conspiracy theory that regards all leftists, progressives, and liberals as conspirators to undermine Western culture and society and turn us all red. 
It's extremely silly, but it's one of those conspiracy theories that is accepted by the alt-right as facts. It's another way they avoid addressing the actual ideas of their opponents. They can just brush them off in a corner without examining them because they're all part of some bullshit conspiracy. If they ever examined those ideas on their own merits, it might require them to think, which might lead them to admitting they are wrong, and that can't be done. So any liberal ideas are put in the cultural Marxism box and ignored. Of course, I think Immortal Ideas is wrong about most things. I think he is uneducated and just regurgitating talking points he's heard elsewhere. I think he's a baby alt-writer who hasn't learned their techniques of disingenuous argument. I think he really believes these things, nonsense though they may be. You see, Immortal Ideas, I actually have read history. And you know what it tells me? It tells me that goose-stepping morons like yourself should try reading books instead of banning them. But his video is a wonderful jumping in point for examining the alt-right because he meanders through so many topics. He may not know much, but we can learn much by examining his errors. Let me make this clear. I don't really care about immortal ideas. This video really isn't for him. When I address him, it's only rhetorical. I'm really addressing the wrong-headed ideas and incorrect facts. Immortal ideas is just an imperfect vessel for a toxic message. I don't care if he ever sees this or what he might think of it if he saw it. He is not important. The lies and the hate he spreads is important. As always, we attack the ideas, not the person. Thanks for watching. I'd like to examine other vloggers on YouTube, but I'm not exactly sure where to go next. If you have any ideas, let me know.